to what they think needs to be put in place to help other families dealing with such a loss? Many thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions. And we now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 13313 in the name of Liz Smith and Scotland Universities. I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. Extraordinarily tight for time today. Call on Liz Smith to speak to and move the motion up to 10 minutes, please, Ms Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I don't think it really matters which uh, academic, economic or social measurement is chosen. Scottish universities are held in high esteem across the world. And that's because they have a very long-standing and proud tradition of attracting the very best students and staff, of achieving academic excellence and maintaining their international competitiveness. And that, together with the fact that higher education is one of the key sectors of the Scottish economy, contributing 6.7 billion annually, makes them hugely significant institutions which both define and enhance the academic, social and cultural life of Scotland. What are the features that have allowed them to do this? Well, firstly, it is their diversity. 16 universities, including the Open University, and three specialist higher education institutions, the Glasgow School of Art, the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland, and Scotland's Rural College. Their ages range from two to 601, and their foundations reflect our diverse educational history. Way back to ancient papal bull, Royal Charters, five were established in the 1992 Higher Education Scotland Act, one by Privy Council consent, and four are companies limited by guarantee. But most importantly, that diversity reflects each institution's unique role when it comes to the pursuit of academic excellence and its contribution to world-class research and knowledge exchange. Time after time, those in the sector point to the crucial importance of maintaining that diversity if Scotland is to continue to lead the way a point stressed by Louise Richardson in her recent speech to SCIS and by several other principals who seem increasingly prepared to express in public their fears that increasing the amount of government regulation is detrimental to the diversity of the university system. Now, that's not personal opinion, but it's because of professional expertise and the fact that the OECD studies across the world have found a direct correlation between institutional autonomy and the quality of the education offered. Just three weeks ago, Professor Peter Downes of University Scotland and the Principal of Dundee said that the Scottish Government should reflect very seriously on the wide range of evidence that says that the proposals in the Scottish Government's consultation paper on governance will damage universities' uh, success. And he added that it was not just a comment from the sector, but from many voices in Civic Scotland. And that's a very strong comment from the sector, which bends over backwards to be non-political and objective in its analysis. University autonomy, until now, has never really been in question for the simple reason that it has allowed the institutions to employ their expertise and professional judgment when it comes to teaching and to investing in the future, something which quite clearly gives them the versatility that is so crucial if they are to respond to the, effectively to the demands of the global world. And being in no doubt about the speed with which that versatility must operate as universities respond to the intense international pressures which are constantly upon them. But a third factor is because they have enjoyed good governance. Governance structures which have continued to evolve, evolve over the years to ensure that there is effective, inclusive and transparent management of the universities as they seek to be fully accountable for both the public and the private funds that they receive. Now, I've looked very carefully at the submissions in the consultation. Criticisms from some, notably the UCU and the NUS, that the opposite is true, that there is very little transparency when it comes to the management of the universities and that they are somehow out of touch. I've read their submissions very carefully and I note their concerns about the levels of principal's pay and reference to FOIs about senior management remunerations, which the UCA claims were not sufficiently transparent. But apart from that, I am struggling to find any evidence whatsoever that supports the claim that the current form of university governance is a major issue. And this, Deputy Presiding Officer, is a very serious matter because it seems that the Scottish Government is hell-bent on meddling in governance and exerting more and more control over the sector. But to what end? Where actually is the evidence that the current governance structures are in any way having a detrimental effect on the educational experiences of our students, on academic standards and on the ability of, staff to attract, of, of institutions to attract the best staff? Now, we note one proposal from the Scottish Government is to ensure that there are elected chairs of court voted in by a much wider electorate than just the members of the court. But what happens to the crucial working relationship between the chairman 
and the board, if a successful candidate, is not one whom the board has any confidence in or whom, for whom they didn't actually vote. And is it not already the case that boards include staff, students and alumni, as well as the diverse range of independent members who bring expertise from a very wide range of backgrounds, whether that's in the public, private or third sectors? In any case, why should the composition of senates or academic bodies be a matter for any government? And in the context of those institutions which are constituted as companies, such as the Royal Conservatoire, would it actually be legal for the Scottish Parliament to legislate to require a company to change its articles of association? Or in the case of charitable status, which our universities enjoy, how would moves to amend the powers of boards sit with the regulations required by Oscar? But there is another worrying proposal from the Scottish Government which says that it wants to legislate to include in the statutory requirement about academic freemen and it must have the exploration of new ideas. Why? Haven't the universities proved over many generations that they are perfectly capable of fostering new ideas without any government telling them what to do? The Scottish Government says it also wants to force university governing bodies and courts to include representatives of particular interest groups. Now, that's something that is actually contrary to the Nolan Committee principles of property within public life. And again, it would undermine the independence of the Governing Council. Yet again, the Scottish Government has not provided one shred of evidence about why that should be necessary. Is it perhaps because it believes university government per governance perpetrates inequalities? Well, I don't think so, because the current system of governance has the full support of the Equality Challenge Unit, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, and the Scottish Funding Council. Is it because there is a gender equality issue that too few women are in governance positions? Well, no, because no fewer than five out of the last six appointments to chairs of court are women, and 42% of all the recent appointments to governing bodies are women, and they are on there because of merit. Or is it because they're not seen as sufficiently accountable? Well, I don't think so either, because recent research has shown that universities are involved in no fewer than 550 lines of reporting to government and external agencies, and not one of these has made a complaint about reporting procedures. So I come back again to ask, where is the evidence that there is any sense of failure among the current structures of governance which are undermining the performance of our universities? Would it not be better for the Scottish Government, rather than trying to tackle a problem which does not exist, to concentrate on the problems which do exist, on the real educational priorities such as raising literacy and numeracy levels, closing the attainment gap and the provision of much better bursary support for poorer students. Because for all the SNP's boasting about free higher education, it actually hides the truth that students from poorer backgrounds are proportionately worse off now compared to what they were when the SNP came to power. And that's something that has prompted Lucy Hunter Blackburn, who used to be the Scottish Government's higher education officer back in 2000 to 2004, she said very recently, Scotland is unique in having a system which assigns the highest student debt to those from the lowest income groups. Indeed, non-repayable grants in Scotland form a significantly lower percentage of total student support than is the case in other jurisdictions. So there's a serious issue there about the claims when it comes to student support. And it does not sit well with the Scottish Government, which claims that social justice is at the very centre of its policy focus. Of course, all that raises the much wider issue about what is a more equitable and sustainable method of university funding. Now, the SNP has made plain many times, many times indeed, that it's committed to free higher education. And that is its choice. But in doing so, it must explain the following. If it does choose to find, fund free higher education, how will it finance it? Will it cut, cut college budgets again? or in other areas of public expenditure, or will it raise taxes? How will it close the funding gap, which is undoubtedly growing between Scotland and the other parts of the UK? Will it continue with its highly discriminatory policy, which means that domiciled Scots and EU students pay no fees, while their counterparts in the rest of the UK and from non-EU foreign students do? And how will it raise sufficient bursary funds to support poorer students? These are the real issues, Cabinet Secretary, which the Scottish public want answered before the Scottish election next year. Rather than some vindictive, bureaucratic and completely unnecessary attack on university governance, which shows no sign whatsoever of having any problems, how will the Scottish Government explain to the people of Scotland that it has that as a priority rather than all the other pressing issues in education? So as we await the Scottish Government's legislative response to the consultation exercise, can we ask them to take stock carefully and consider 
what really is in the best interests of our universities, a sector which is autonomous and free thinking, or one which is increasingly enthralled to government and its restrictive practices. I move the motion in my name. Many thanks. I now call on Angela Constance to speak to and move Amendment 13313.2. Cabinet Secretary, up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased that the Conservatives have chosen to discuss higher education today uh, because that gives me the chance and the opportunity to uh, celebrate Scotland's universities and the achievements of their staff and students. And I want to highlight the commitment of this government to invest in our universities to benefit all learners, to grow our economy and to enhance the international reputation for teaching and research uh, enjoyed by our institutions. And it is clear that universities make a pivotal contribution to Scotland by enabling a better educated workforce, by fostering inclusive economic growth and supporting links and collaboration uh, with our neighbours uh, in the UK, the EU and other nations across the world. And rankings from October 2014 show that Scotland has four universities in the top 200 in the world, uh, more per head uh, of the population than any other country uh, apart from Switzerland. And Scottish higher education is thriving, presiding officer. In 2014, Eurostat figures highlighted that Scotland had the highest percentage uh, of population with tertiary education attainment of all European countries listed at 46.5%. And that is six percentage points uh, higher than the UK figure at 40.5%. Of course. Ms Smith. I thank her. So I, I absolutely agree with these statistics. But on what grounds does the Cabinet Secretary believe that universities have, achieve, have achieved such outstanding success? £20 billion pounds of funding every year uh, committed to by this government has uh, made some contribution. Uh, there are, of course, uh, many other um, people who should be congratulated, not least the staff uh, and the students and the institutions uh, th th themselves. To move on to... Uh, some of the substantive points that Ms Smith uh, raised in her uh, opening contribution, presiding officer. Um, this government, just to make clear, uh, values the autonomous uh, nature of universities. Uh, this is part of the reason that we've had the confidence to invest over £4 billion uh, in the higher education sector since uh, 2011. And funding of over £1 billion uh, is planned for the next academic year. However, with many areas of government expenditure under pressure, it is not easy to maintain this heavyweight financial commitment. And as part uh, of the return uh, for this investment, we expect institutions to adhere to the highest standards of governance. And building on the work done uh, since the publication of the Review of Higher Education Governance in 2012, uh, we do plan to introduce a bill to Parliament uh, in the very near future. And this new legislation will enhance governance arrangements uh, in our universities. And essentially, uh, as a government, we want to work with universities to ensure that their governance arrangements are always evolving, modern, transparent and inclusive. And our legislative, legislative plans um, are designed to complement work already taken forward uh, by our institutions, the autonomous nature of our universities has many benefits. However, in return for substantial investment, the Scottish Government wants to help ensure that all parts of the university community uh, have their voices heard uh, in a more consistent way. Ms Smith. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary again. Could uh, the Cabinet Secretary explain why she thinks that Professor Downes uh, said that the Scottish Government should, and I quote, reflect very seriously on the wide range of evidence that says the current proposals in the Scottish Government's consultation paper will damage universities' contributions to Scotland's success. Well, we are person. indeed considering the, the wide range of evidence that's available in Scotland and uh, across uh, the developed world. We also have the consultation uh, that was conducted earlier on this year. We, of course, as an open, transparent government, have indeed published uh, that consultation. Uh, we've been very uh, open about that. Uh, I appreciate and understand the views of people like uh, Professor Downs, but I also, uh, on the other side, uh, have representations 
um, from organisations such as the University uh, and College uh, Union uh, of Scotland, who delivered 1,400 of these postcards, uh, which are currently uh, sitting up in my office, calling um, for improvements uh, in higher education governance. And it is important to stress that existing government structures um, which have been informed uh, by the, the code uh, of good governance have served institutions well. Uh, but uh, I believe that higher education is capable um, of further improvements and that greater uh, inclusivity and more transparent governance can only help uh, our universities to develop and adapt uh, to the challenges that they face in the future. Signing off, so this government is rightly proud of its defence and maintenance of free tuition. Um, elsewhere in these islands, students have expected to ac accumulate loan debt of up to £27,000 uh, to pay for their period of study. Uh, and of course, it is possible that the UK government might allow that figure to increase further. And we do recognise that positive contribution uh, our universities make to Scotland's economy and society and the benefits they and Scotland derive from levering additional funding from Europe uh, and welcoming international students. And this government will continue uh, to push for the reintroduction of the, the post-study uh, work visa. Scotland's higher education progress and achievements, uh, presiding officer, are all the more impressive, achieved as they are against a backdrop of a UK government focused on austerity, a UK government focused on restricting access to study in the UK for international students, and a UK government focused on fostering uh, instability by taking forward plans for an in-out referendum on membership of the EU. And if I can just briefly, presiding officer, share a couple of facts about what universities and government um, have achieved by working together. We know that Scots domiciled first degree university entrance uh, has risen, 57% of those students uh, are female. And it is important to recognise, presiding officer, that in, time, in the time available, it is difficult to tell the whole story uh, of the collective success of universities. But it is clear that Scottish universities have a world-class reputation for research, with 77% uh, of the research assessed as world-leading or internationally excellent uh, in the close, 2014 uh, Research Excellence uh, Framework. And I look forward, presiding officer, uh, to the debate this afternoon. Moving the amendment, perhaps. Many thanks. I move I now, the amendment in my name. Many thanks. I now call on Ian Gray. Up to five minutes, please, Mr Gray, if you speak to move Amendment 13313.1. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to move the amendment uh, in my name. And that amendment uh, leaves intact the first half or so of the Conservative motion before us this afternoon for the very simple reason that there can really be no disagreement that our universities make an outstanding contribution to the academic, economic, social and cultural life of our nation, or indeed that they enhance our international uh, reputation. We punch well above our weight when it comes to universities, and um, uh, speakers uh, already this early in the debate have pointed out that we have four of the top 200 universities, the highest concentration uh, of world-class universities per head of population anywhere in the world. Ms Smith uh, pointed out the sector's economic impact, estimated at over £6.5 billion, pounds, and indeed £1.3 billion pounds of export earnings uh, generated by the sector. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned uh, post-work visas and overseas students, some 30,000 students from over 180 countries who come to Scotland to study here. But we do know uh, uh, and Ms Smith uh, made reference to this too, that competitors in the rest of the developed world and in fast-growing economies are making rapid progress in competing with our higher education institutions. And the truth is, if we try to stand still, we will find ourselves going backwards. Uh, now, the Scottish Government has invested uh, in the sector, certainly in comparison with FE, for example, where 140,000 students have been lost our colleges, or indeed schools with over 4,000 fewer teachers there than when the SNP came to power. But there are worrying signs in HE2. Last year's budget, this year's budget, approved by this parliament just recently, it allocated to higher education a flat cash settlement of just over £1 billion. 
But days later, university funding was cut by £21 million, resulting in the abolition of the Global Excellence Fund, only launched two years previously, uh, and resulting in cuts to research funding in all our major universities. Capital funding, too, was cut in that budget to a historic low. And commentators have also raised questions about transfers of higher education resource uh, to SAS to support student funding, creating funding pressures elsewhere. Uh, that now amounts to £14 million a year, and combined with the clawback, the reality is that university settlement this year is down by around 2.5%. And these pressures are having a real impact with job cuts threatened in Aberdeen, in Dundee and at the Scottish Marine Institute uh, in Oban. And that's exactly how a standstill budget can quickly turn into decline if the warning signals are ignored. Nonetheless, our universities are the recipients of very large sums of public funding. And yes, they are autonomous. And that autonomy should be properly guarded, particularly in terms of what they teach, what research they do, and what academic challenge they might mount to whomsoever they choose. But they also properly have an obligation to face a degree of accountability, transparency, and consistency in their governance and administration. That was the conclusion of the Prandinsky Review into Higher Education Governance. And that lack of accountability has been symbolized above all by the high levels of principal's pay with significant increases and bonuses too paid in many cases throughout the period of public sector pay restraint. And all this at a time when the sector was one of the worst offenders in the public sector, at least when it came to low pay and the use of zero hours contracts. Now I'm happy to acknowledge recent progress on the living wage zero hours contracts and indeed governance in the sector, although uh, one does wonder the degree to which the uh, imminence of the potential legislation we debate today uh, had to do in uh, pushing uh, the, the sector in that direction. But that progress has been slow and sporadic, and so we cannot agree with the main thrust of the Tory amendment. We do not believe that the government's proposed legislation compromises the academic autonomy of our universities, nor do we believe that the voluntary introduction of the governance review will provide the required transparency and consistency. We do support the election of chairs, although there is much work to be done on the detail of that, greater diversity on ruling bodies, and direct representation for trade unions on governing bodies. So autonomy, yes, but responsible autonomy, ancient institutions, yes, but redesigned for the modern world as they must indeed be in order to maintain their crucial and pivotal role at the centre of our nation. Thanks. I now move to open debate and I call on George Adam to be followed by James Kelly. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I, I agree that our university sector does make an outstanding contribution, both academically and socially and culturally, to Scotland. But that is why the Scottish Government is maintaining university budgets while the UK Government cuts its funding for English universities. But the major points for me in today's debate, uh, President Officer, are that, as the Cabinet Secretary has already said, Scotland is a leading nation in higher education, with the four universities in the world top 200, as already has been mentioned, and four education institutions undertaking research of world-leading quality. And the important fact is that education is free of fees in Scotland. Free tuition, fee is, free tuition saves over 120,000 undergraduate students, up to £27,000 compared to the cost of study in England. And my final point that I will develop further as well is that the public have the right to expect universities to be accountable. That is why we must look at the governance of our higher education. But the Scottish Government is maintaining university budgets while the UK uh, Government is uh, cutting for the ones. The investment that Scotland's universities support the world-class high-impact research and help them build links across the world. And it's already been mentioned by many of my colleagues here how successful that has been. And it's also providing over a billion pounds per year for higher education sector in 2014-15 and 2015-16. So Scotland's reputation in the university sector is well known throughout the world, but this reputation is proven internationally in the fact that Scotland is a leading nation in higher education. 
And uh, the whole idea is that uh, Phil ba ba Batty of the editor of TES Rankings said that Scotland was really standing out as one of the strongest higher education countries in the world. That alone tells us, presiding officer, just what other people think of the higher education sector in Scotland. But I also mentioned, and it has been mentioned by some of my colleagues as well, that the public has a right to expect universities to be accountable. And that is why, quite rightly, we expect higher education institutions to adhere to the highest standards of governments. The aim of the Higher Education Governance Bill is to modernise and strengthen governance, embedding the principles of democracy and accountability in the high, higher education sector. If, presiding officer, we were looking at the higher education sector at this point from day one, we would not necessarily have uh, create the governance mo model that we currently have. Now, obviously, our universities and institutions have such a uh, rich history, and uh, that is part of uh, the issues that we are dealing with. Uh, and they do uh, are some of the most autonomous uh, institutions in the world. But we must find a way to be able to balance that to ensure that uh, we can see that the public money is accountable and that we have trade union representatives and other organisations and that universities become part of their local community. Because I think that is one of the most important points that we need to make sure that they must continue to have strong democratic accountability in their government's arrangements and remain fit for purpose in modern Scotland. Professor Ferdinand von Prondinsky, Principal and Vice-Chancellor of Robert Gordon University, has already said the proposals set out by the government are important elements in getting this balance between autonomy and public confidence, uh, confidence right. Scotland's universities are a great success story, and they have nothing to fear from the proposed legislation and a lot to gain. And I think that is one of the most important uh, points here. So, in closing, presiding officer, I would say that any proposals brought forward by the Scottish Government will add to the fantastic work already done by our universities. This is about ensuring our universities continue to thrive internationally and locally, but being open, accountable, modern institutions that will continue to deliver for Scotland. Many thanks. Now I call on James Kelly to be followed by Stuart Maxwell. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the fact that the Conservatives are using their time this afternoon to look at the key issue of how we organise our universities uh, in Scotland. I think the, the issues in the debate are around governance and on the funding of universities. I think that has to be seen in the context of what are we looking for from our universities? We obviously see them as institutions to allow our young people to go forward and receive uh, good quality education so that they can then play a proper role in society and contribute to a growing economy. We see them as institutions which at attract uh, support and investment uh, from overseas. And we also see them as uh, places of research and development which can develop uh, our skills and our specialities that Scottish education has become so uh, famous for. And I think it's against that backdrop that you, you need to look at the governance and funding issues. Um, I know that there's been, the Conservatives seem to take a kind of, uh, almost like a, a free market approach uh, to the governance issues. Uh, surely, yeah. Alex Johnson. Will the member accept that what we are taking is not a free market approach, it is a fundamentally liberal approach. And that is the approach that is completely missing right around this chamber, except for this corner. James Kelly. Well, what, I would say, what I was going to go on to say, Mr Johnson, is that uh, whereas legislation should not be used for legislation's sake, as Mr Gray and others have pointed out, uh, huge amounts of public money are invested in our universities and the students and the wider public, the taxpayers, uh, are entitled to a certain amount of openness and transparency. I do, uh, if ve very briefly... Ms Smith. Very briefly, on what grounds are you arguing, sorry, is the member arguing, that there is a serious problem in higher education? Where, where is the evidence that we are failing because governance isn't good enough? Well, let me, let me go on to the next point of my speech, which I was going to develop, is that um, 
I believe that there are actually more fundamental issues that we've got to address in the university sector than simply just governance. Governance can be used to help. But if you take the skill shortage uh, in the economy as an example, you know, we've now got a real development in the app economy. There are 5.8 million app jobs uh, across, uh, sorry, 1.8 million app jobs uh, across Europe and that is anticipated to grow to 5.8 million in 2018, but we've got a real shortage uh, in Scotland and also across the UK, over 900,000 uh, job shortages in, in terms of skills, uh, sorry, engineering skills and IT. And I think there's a real job for our universities uh, with proper leadership from the government to tackle the issue of a shortage uh, shortages in engineering and information technology and I think in order to do that you do need uh, proper governance aligned uh, with leadership from the government and also proper funding and I think that's why it's extremely regrettable that we see 21, a 21 million reduction uh, in university funding which has affected the research funding and therefore uh, undermines our ability to contribute towards specialities like growing close, the, the app economy sector. So I think it's got, the debate's got to be viewed in, in a wider context. Uh, governance is one part of it, and I do accept that it's not just a case of introducing legislation. It's got to be tested so that it, it works. And we also need to look at fundamental issues like the skill shortage. Thank you, Deputy Thank you very much. Officer. Now, Colin Stewart Maxwell to be followed by Annabel Goldie. Up to four minutes, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I very much welcome the opportunity to speak in this afternoon's debate on the important contribution that our universities make to Scotland. Liz Smith is, of course, right to highlight the positive educational, cultural, and economic benefits our universities bring to Scotland. As others have said, with four universities ranked in the world's top 200, there's no question that Scotland's higher education system is one of the best in the world. We continue to punch above our weight, as evidenced by the Times Higher Education Rankings, which now show Scotland ranked first when measured by GDP and ranked second when measured by population. Recent studies indeed have also suggested that Scotland is the most highly educated country in Europe and the best place to study in the UK. That we have managed to create the circumstances in which Scotland's universities can thrive is testament to the support and indeed the investment provided by the Scottish Government. Restoring free education to Scotland and thereby ensuring that university education is based on the ability to learn rather than the ability to pay is undoubtedly one of the SNP's proudest achievements. Now, last year I asked SPICE to look at how much free higher education saves Scottish students. It was found that over 120,000 undergraduate students save up to £20,000 compared to the cost of studying in England. But to put that in context, tuition fees rose to £9,000 presiding officer in the rest of the UK. And in the first three years that they were in force, they cost students there around £14 billion, while Scottish domicile students attending Scottish institutions have saved almost £1 billion in fees over the same number of years. That is an enormous sum of money that the Scottish Government have saved Scottish domicile students, and it's something we should be proud of. The current funding arrangements for universities for down south result in tuition fees which put higher education out of the reach of many young people. In Scotland, we've been able to use the powers of this Parliament to protect free university tuition and open the doors of opportunity to many young Scots. We should be proud of our universities. They are a true national asset and world-leading in many areas. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't strive to make them better. The Scottish Government has invested more than £4 billion in higher education over the past four years. That's a significant amount of public money, and our constituents have the right to expect their universities to be transparent, accountable, and adhere to the highest standards of governance. Professor von Brunzinski's review of higher education governance has been integral to informing the Scottish Government's work in strengthening the sector. It is vital that the framework for the governance of our universities is fit for purpose for a modern Scotland in the 21st century. Now, writing in the Herald in April, Professor von Brunzinski spoke of the importance of striking the right balance between restoring public confidence and protecting the autonomy of our universities, because there is no argument I don't think across this chamber that their universities have to retain their autonomy. But he concluded by saying, Scotland's universities are a great success story. They have nothing to fear from this proposed legislation and a lot to gain. I agree very much with that sentiment. Presenting officer, the Tory motion suggests that these proposals are somehow a threat to the success of our higher education sector in Scotland. 
I'd argue that instead of these, the reforms will go a long way to ensuring that our world-class universities continue to thrive, creating a modern framework for decision-making that benefits the institutions, the staff and the students. It seems to me that the real threat to the international standing of Scotland's universities is the refusal of the Tory UK Government to reintroduce the post-study work visa to Scotland. We debated this at length in Parliament some weeks back, but the point remains that the UK Government's immigration policies are restricting Scotland's ability to attract and retain the best international students and graduates. International students make a valuable contribution to Scotland, but higher education stats show that there has been a drop in the number attending Scottish universities. Draw to a, close, please. a strong case has been made for the restoration of the post-study work visa. To conclude, Presiding Officer, I am proud that the SNP has defended free education throughout our time in office. The Scottish Government continues to strongly invest in the higher education sector, and I look forward to our world-renowned universities going from strength to strength in the years ahead. Many thanks. Now call on Animal Goldie to be followed by Nigel Dodd. Presiding Officer, let me declare an interest. My alma mater is the University of Strathclyde, of which I am an honorary fellow, and not surprisingly, I hold my former university in high esteem. I owe it a lot. When established in my career as a lawyer, it was a privilege to be invited to serve on the university court, a role which I discharged for a considerable number of years. Uncertain about what was involved, I rapidly realised that I was part of an exciting and a fascinating forum with challenging responsibilities. I find myself in an inspiring company, impressive academics, people from other professions and businesses, leaders of industry, a member of Glasgow City Council, one Hanzala Malik, with, if I recall correctly, a recently retired very senior civil servant, a representative of the non-teaching staff and the president of the student union. There was even then a significant presence, Deputy Presiding Officer, of significant women. The backgrounds were diverse, but this grouping aggregated into a powerhouse of knowledge, skill, experience and wisdom, reflecting a collective ability which was impressive. We did not represent sectoral interests. Our collegiate focus was the best interests of the whole university. This group was also comfortable with its knowledge of each other about deciding who was best placed to chair the court. The discussions were amongst the most well-informed and well-argued it has ever been my privilege to take part in. The university benefited from enlightened and strategic decision-making and effective governance. Now, I know some politicians feel uncomfortable about that. Shortly after I entered this parliament, a political opponent, a former MSP, observed that because universities were public bodies receiving public money, they should be more under the control of government. I think a sentiment being echoed by the Cabinet Secretary. Well, fortunately, having attended a university where I was encouraged to question such intellectual candy floss, I pointed, up, pointed out that although universities derived a proportion of funding from government, they raised the rest themselves, hence in no way conforming to the definition of being a public body. And as Liz Smith has said, we now know from that OECD survey across Europe that there is a direct link between the autonomy of universities and the quality of universities. Each university is different in character and culture, very different. And far from demonstrating any weakness of inconsistency, that vital diversity is a huge strength. In Scotland, our universities over centuries and decades have showcased the best in learning, research, academic freedom and independence of approach. That is no casual platitude. That is the intellectual forum which is the lifeblood of any seat of learning. It should exist to question, to challenge, to stimulate the mind, to explore and to discover the new by examination, by analysis, by research and by deduction. Above all, Deputy Presiding Officer, universities should be free of any whiff of political control, state intervention in or state prescription about governance. And without any supporting evidence, the Scottish Government wants to wreck that autonomy, trample over freedoms and demolish the fundamental elements of good governance. I have to say this has echoes of the chaotic debacle which surrounded the botched attempt to abolish corroboration. But let me now utter a platitude. Fools rush in where angels fear to tread. The Cabinet Secretary is a highly intelligent woman. She is no fool. 
And when the Scottish Government proposals to change university governance meet serious and compelling criticism from University Scotland, from the Principal of Dundee University, Professor Peter Downs, from the Principal of St Andrews University, Professor Louise Richardson, herself moving to a very senior position at Oxford University in the near future, from the Royal Society of Edinburgh, close, please? from the Scottish Council for Development Industry and numerous others, and when the system of, of, support, of governance has the full support of the Scottish Funding Council, the Equality Challenge Unit and the Equality and Human Rights Commission, I, Deputy Presiding Officer, would not be treading where the Cabinet Secretary proposes to go. Only one conclusion will be drawn. Please have the courage and the wisdom to withdraw these unnecessary, dangerous close, and inept proposals. Thank you very much. I now call on Nigel Dawn to be followed by Richard Baker. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I be, say that I'm very grateful to Annabel Goldie for describing how it can be done so very well. And I think the point in any sensible society is that we want to make sure that it is always done very well. Alex Johnson tells me this is all about a liberal approach. A liberal approach is undoubtedly what I would want to see. But I do think we want to follow the public pound at least well enough to ensure that the body to which that money goes is accountable. And I do hear some very loose descriptions of accountability and control. And it seems to me that accountability to the general public, whether or not it's this parliament, is one thing and control is something very, very different. We have in our society, presiding officer, all sorts of discussions between those who have some kind of embedded value and a vested interest and those who see an opportunity uh, using their own talents and abilities. In classical economics, that's actually capital versus labor. I would prefer the idea in this kind of educational debate that it has something to do with the institutions and our universities are fine ones and the opportunities which students and staff recognize. I'd like to pick up briefly because it is inevitably brief this afternoon, on three different issues which have emerged in the consultation. Could I first of all point out, presiding officer, that as I read through uh, the summary of the responses to the governance bill, that I am struck on several pages by the very different views that I get, and I'm going to use the terms loosely, from the management of the universities and everybody else. It's not universal, but it does seem to me that there are two very different aspects and views of our universities coming through, which I find slightly discouraging because I would have hoped that there could have been slightly more unanimity within those and among those who work there as to what the collective vested interest was and what the public interest was. And that diversity of opinion seems to me to be sharp enough that uh, those who are in charge might like to think about why that gap is there. Secondly, I'd like to look at the issue of elected chairs because it did strike me that there were some very strange things in here. Uh, if I may pick up from page four on the consultation written responses, which members will have seen, uh, quoting from one to four, most universities oppose the proposal that chairs should be remunerated, with a common view being that the post of the chair is essentially a voluntary one, with those putting themselves forward doing so on a pro bono basis as part of a public service commitment. Can I say, presiding officer, I think that belongs to a different generation, possibly century, if that isn't the same thing. Why on earth is it that we should be restricting it to those who can afford to be there pro bono or if they can't and they're being employed by somebody else, why on earth should somebody else be paying them to do the job? Everybody else in the university is paid quite well at the top, and I'm not at all clear where that comes from. Lastly, presiding officer, uh, may I look at the issue of the way in which universities change? Um, I, had, uh, I was reminded when I looked at this of my time as a student in the 70s, uh, and I discovered that, uh, and I was reminded that uh, we as students wrote a report uh, which we put to the college officers uh, about how it might be that students should be represented on the college body. Um, that was written in 1975. Um, we eventually got two things done. The first was that our college in Cambridge allowed women to come in as students. That took 10 years. Um, and the idea that there should be student members on the College Council was, as far as I can see, enacted in a 2009 statute. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. I conclude simply with the comments that that report and my fellow student was none other than the Right Honourable Oliver Heald, QC MP. Known, I suspect, to my Tory colleagues. The point is that as students, we did see it differently. And actually, the issues that we raised then as, stitched, as, as students still apply. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Colin Richard Baker to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased Parliament has this opportunity to debate the challenges facing our universities because in Aberdeen, the issue of support for our university sector is a very current concern. Our local university has announced it is to lose 150 posts, and this has caused great anxiety amongst our staff and students. It raises very real questions of how our universities are equipped to perform their vital role in our country. In Aberdeen, the impact on our local economy of both Aberdeen University and the Robert Gordon University cannot be overstated. And it's also, of course, of great importance nationally in terms of support for our oil and gas industry and skills and expertise there. So we must hear today from the Minister, from the Cabinet Secretary, how the Scottish Government will ensure our universities will receive the resources they need to recruit and retain the staff they require in the ferociously competitive global higher education sector, and specifically how they will support Aberdeen at university and ensure there are no compulsory redundancies. Higher education is an area where we've long had a competitive advantage. It's not one as a nation we can afford to lose. Staff at Aberdeen University should be rewarded for their efforts rather than face redundancy, and this demands a response from the Scottish Government. Presiding officer, the contributions to the debate today from most members reflect a consensus which has been established that free tuition is the right policy for Scotland. And of course, in Labour, we had hoped to reduce fees in England, which would have provided a financial boost for the sector here. However, I think any temptation there is to say we have free tuition fees in Scotland, so that's the job done for higher education here, well, that must be resisted. I'm, I'm not sure it has been over the past few years. We've long debated the impact of the cuts in further education, and the University of Scotland submission outlines funding challenges in the higher uh, education sector in Scotland as well. On capital funding, we can understand why the constraints are, are there, the context in which the Scottish Government works, but on research funding, uh, cuts in that area can only be damaging to institutions and to our economy. There are wider issues as well. Some of our institutions uh, have seen the worst dropout rates in the UK, and I wouldn't be surprised if they were amongst the worst in Europe. That's an opportunity wasted for those students who drop out, and wasted investment for the state, but it's certainly not discussed enough in this Parliament. If we want our universities to be the best they can be, to be as proud of them as we should be, ministers must get to grips with this issue as well, to understand it and to seek solutions. We're also still not doing enough to widen access, and as has been discussed, uh, to both these issues. Uh, student support is a crucial, of a crucial importance. The level of grant available to students from low-income backgrounds uh, is of massive importance to success of their studies. Uh, uh, so, of course, students here have benefited from free tuition, but in other parts of the UK, they've had better grants and student support. Uh, and this is an issue which requires more debate and scrutiny in Scotland. On the issue of governance, presiding officer, of course it's important university courts are properly inclusive, that staff are represented. And looking back, we previously had elected chairs of courts through the roles uh, of rectors. Uh, so, and as Ian Gray said, reform uh, is important and accountability is important. But that in, in that context, the independence of universities must also be respected. This is a government which has been quick to take powers to itself rather than devolve them and to seek to control from the centre organisations like colleges, which should be empowered to make the decisions locally which best fit their distinctive needs. In the same way, universities must have proper local accountability. accountability. Beyond that, but beyond that, their independence is important, not Don't an argument course, against reform, please. but against an overbearing approach from central government, and accountability to staff and students, not simply to ministers. Our universities are held in high esteem. They are high achievers. Our job is to enable them to continue that vital role for Scotland. I'm afraid I have to advise members there's absolutely no time. Please stick to your time. Gordon MacDonald. Officer. Uh, my constituency has two universities within its boundary, Edinburgh Napier and Harriet Walk. And I take a great interest in both institutions, not only because I'm a member of the Education Committee, but because my sons graduated from those universities. 
Edinburgh Napier is in the top 20 of UK universities for graduate employability, with 95% of undergraduates and 92% of postgraduates still in employment or further study six months after graduating. And importantly, Edinburgh Napier has over many years worked with partners to build aspirations for higher education amongst those from low participation neighbourhoods and non-traditional backgrounds. Community engagement takes place in schools, colleges, resulting in 2,292 students joining Edinburgh Napier directly from Scottish colleges in 2013-14. Heriot Watt University is ranked second in Scotland and 18th in the UK by the Guardian University Guide, although the UK ranking hides the fact that it's second in the UK for civil engineering, third in the UK for electronics and ele electrical engineering and accounting and finance. To encourage a widening of access to its courses, Heriot Watt awards six million in scholarships, bursaries to over 400 students each year. And as others have said, President Officer, Scotland is a leading nation in higher education, with four universities in the world's top 200, each of our higher education institutions undertaking research of world-leading quality. This is in part due to the funding that our universities have received in recent years from the Scottish Government. Last year and this year, the Scottish Government is providing over a billion pounds per annum to the higher education sector. Given that level of investment of public funds into universities, it would be a miss of the Scottish Government if it did not take an interest in the sector. The report of the Review of Higher Education Governance in Scotland submitted to the Scottish Ministers in January 2012 highlighted why it was important. I quote, Universities in today's world play many roles of direct significance to society, going well beyond the personal interests of those embarking on higher education, well beyond the organisational ambitions of individual institutions, and well beyond the expectations of those who employ graduates. They stimulate economic development, they provide a focus for cultural growth, they are engines of social regeneration, they play a major part in establishing a positive view of Scotland internationally. Universities are major employers and providers of livelihoods, and they own and control buildings, land and infrastructure that are vital assets for communities. They instigate and nourish public debate and provide necessary critical analysis of the ideas and actions of public bodies and politicians. Final minute. For all these reasons, university governance is not just a private matter. Indeed, the public interest in university governments arguably extends beyond that which applies to corporate governance in the business world. It is not just a question of assuring the integrity and transparency of processes, it is a question of allowing society to protect its broader investment in education, knowledge and intellectual innovation in a way that makes the most of a long Scottish tradition adapted to the needs of the 21st century. Our higher education institutions should reflect society we live in, and as the NUS Scotland President-elect stated in the press recently, as public bodies rightly and receive well over a billion pounds every year, we want to see our universities open themselves up to greater transparency, democracy and accountability, close, staying please. relevant to and representative of the people they serve. The proposed reforms to higher education governance gives us a great opportunity to ensure that happens. Thank you very much. Uh, we now turn to the closing speeches. A colleague in grey, no more than four minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Officer. This has really been, although short, a two-pronged debate, hasn't it? Some debate around the success of our universities and their funding, uh, but mostly around uh, governance and the need for reform. Uh, and I think we have all across the chamber celebrated the success of our university sector. But I do have to say that from some of the uh, SNP speakers, and to a degree perhaps from the Cabinet Secretary herself, there has been a degree of complacency about that. For example, the figure, and I used this figure myself, of four universities in the top 200 in the world. That's been used by a number of speakers in the course of the afternoon. But we should remind ourselves that it was a short 18 months or so ago when we had five universities in the top 200. So uh, we have to be a little careful uh, about the direction in which uh, this, uh, this is going. Uh, Mr Adam spent some time, in fact I think he said three times, uh, that uh, the Scottish Government had maintained 
uh, funding in the higher education sector when that had not been maintained uh, in England. But if Mr Adam uh, had listened, I quoted figures from uh, Lucy Hunter, the former head of higher education uh, <coughs> in the Scottish Government, which show that that is not in fact the case, that this year's budget has seen uh, the resources available to universities cut by 2.5 per cent, 21 million clawed back uh, after the budget was set, and a further 14 million which has been transferred to the Student Awards uh, Agency, and a little bit of um, unusual accounting, I think we could say. Uh, Mr Maxwell uh, focused rather much on uh, what a wonderful world it is in Scotland for students. And um, that too, I think, uh, uh, rather stepped over the reality which students face from day to day. Now, I don't agree with Liz Smith that uh, uh, free tuition fees uh, has created uh, a funding gap between Scottish universities and those in England. And I think the uh, very helpful briefing that NUS provided uh, for this debate uh, gives some detail, too much to go into in the short time I've got, which shows that that funding gap is rather illusory. But Mr Maxwell also said that Scott, this meant Scotland was the best place uh, in Britain to be a student. But as Mr Baker pointed out, that's certainly not the case if you are a student from a poorer family, uh, because the level of bursary and grant support available to you will be significantly less, your level of indebtedness will be significantly higher in order to live, and perhaps that is why we have a lower proportion of poorer students in our universities and, as Mr Baker pointed out, a higher dropout rate. Final minute. As for uh, governance, uh, Liz Smith has asked on a number of occasions where is the evidence of failure, but in her own speech she indicated the, the most egregious evidence of failure, and that is the lack of transparency and very high levels of principal's pay. Even in the last year, principal's pay has risen by between 7 and 13 per cent at a time when most public sector workers are lucky to have 1 per cent. And the UCU, and, and Liz Smith referred to this, the UCU have pointed out that even although universities claim transparency now, when they ask for details of remuneration committee minutes, two-thirds of institutions fail to provide them with that information. That is a failure. It's a failure of governance, and there is no reason at all why we should not consider uh, introducing transparency and consistency. If she talks also to those who take part in the current governance structure, such as staff reps, she will find that they believe the governance system isn't working either, I that they are not close, trade union please. reps, but are often treated as such. Uh, uh, so, uh, as I said in my opening uh, statement, autonomy, yes, but responsible autonomy for a modern day. Thank you. And I call on Angela Constance, Cabinet Secretary, no more than six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Can I start by saying to Mr Gray that while I have many, many faults, I'm sure he's familiar with a few of them, uh, complacency is most certainly uh, not one of them. Uh, on reflecting on today's debate, President Officer, it struck me that Liz Smith, uh, in her opening remarks, used some uncharacteristically uh, strong language, uh, certainly for her. And she described the Scottish Government in pursuing the Higher Education Governance Bill as vindictive, uh, bureaucratic and meddling. And I would like to point out that the EUA Autonomy Scoreboard you know, identifies Scotland's higher education sector as one of the most autonomous in the world. And what our proposals, and what our proposals most certainly are not about, they are not about increasing uh, ministerial control. And I certainly welcome uh, the fact that most members in this chamber today uh, recognise that diversity, inclusiveness and partnership uh, within the higher education sector, that that is not just the right thing to do, it's actually uh, the smart thing to do. Presiding officer, we, we are now in the three-week uh, pre-introduction phase um, of the, the Higher Education Governance Bill, and it is, of course, difficult for me in the context uh, of this debate to discuss and debate in detail of the bill that will be introduced to Parliament uh, in the very near future. But I am confident that we will be able to demonstrate that we have been listening to principals, chairs of court, but also, crucially, uh, to staff and students. Uh, and the commitment that this government makes is that 
you know, post-introduction of the bill that we will continue uh, to work with partners, we will continue to, to collaborate across the sector and indeed across this chamber. Uh, but that has to be uh, a two-way process and I want to ensure that where possible uh, the sector uh, can work together and move forward uh, as uh, a community. Now, we've had some discussion today, President Officer, as you'd expect, with regards to funding. Uh, and it's important to stress uh, that the government, via the, the Scottish Funding Council, plan to invest £282 million uh, in core research and knowledge exchange. Uh, that's a, a very modest uh, increase of half a percent, and that's building on the, the increasing levels uh, of research funding uh, since uh, 2007. And it is important to reflect that higher education resource funding um, since 11-12 uh, up to the financial year 15-16 uh, has increased uh, by 12% in cash terms, uh, more than 5% um, in real terms at a time where the Scottish Government fiscal budget has reduced 9% in real terms and of course our capital budget has been reduced uh, in real terms by, by 25%. But nonetheless, we have, uh, in response to Mr Gray's point, um, said to you know, the Fund Council to proceed with very firm commitments that they can make firm spending plans uh, on £1,041 million. And yes, indeed, we have asked them to hold back uh, £22 million, uh, roughly uh, 2%, so that we do indeed have flexibility uh, across the uh, post-16 education budget. Uh, very briefly. Ingrid. Address the point about the transfers to SAS. Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, there has been a transfer of, of resources, but it is important to recognise uh, that there is no that has no impact on the level of support available to students. And actually, SAS funding, student support funding, uh, is demand-led uh, by the criteria, criteria uh, that is published and which you know, this parliament and this gov government decides on. It is demand-led and therefore uh, responds to, to the needs uh, of, of, of students. And of course, as a government, we will always uh, endeavour, where possible, to increase resources uh, to support students within our um, available resources. And, of course, there was some improvement uh, to the overall love and support package uh, that I announced uh, a few uh, weeks uh, ago. I also want to just, to, for the record, President Officer, clarify uh, another issue. There has indeed been changes to the distribution of the Research Excellence Grant. Um, which has seen six institutions uh, see a reduction in their funding, but 12 institutions uh, have seen an uplift uh, in their research funding. So it's not true to say that um, every institution has had a reduction in their research funding. It is true to say that the Global uh, Excellence Initiative Fund, uh, which was always a time-limited fund, uh, no longer uh, exists, and that, of course, uh, has uh, an impact and institutions uh, in their deliberation. But it is important to recognise that the change uh, in the distribution of the Research Excellence Grant is due to the general improvement of Scottish universities uh, in the UK-wide uh, REF 2014. And if I can also say to um, Mr Baker, uh, who is demanding a response from the Scottish Government with regards to job losses uh, in, in, in Aberdeen, uh, job losses in any institution, in any sector, the length and breadth of Scotland, uh, is always, always uh, regrettable. But it's important to say that the savings being sought to Aberdeen are not related to changes in research funding. Uh, the university have said that they are seeking to make savings of £10.5 million. 30 seconds left. But the reduction in research funding uh, is just £350,000 uh, for uh, the next academic year. And obviously I'll happily uh, close there, President Officer. I appreciate that time is pressing. Many thanks. I now call on Mary Scanlon to wind up the debate. Maximum eight minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think this has been a very good debate uh, with wide-ranging and thoughtful uh, contributions, uh, including Annabel Goldie with her experience on the Board of Governors uh, at Strathclyde. Uh, it's also been an excellent opportunity for all of us uh, to put on record the success of our universities, uh, actually a topic that is almost too rarely debated in this chamber. And can I just say I'm very pleased to hear that the Cabinet Secretary uh, has listened to University Scotland and will respond. Uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's very helpful. 
Uh, presiding officer, I do think uh, on this day of commemoration in another house for Charles Kennedy that it's worth putting on the record his role uh, as the rector of Glasgow University, particularly in this debate on Scotland's universities today. I hope members don't mind. <laughs> Thank you uh, to members for that, and obviously as a Highland MP. Uh, but no one connected with higher education or Scot in Scotland or who aspires to be uh, can be unconcerned about what the future uh, will hold, specifically how we can look to protect and enhance our academic uh, traditions and the autonomy of our universities, which almost all members spoke about, given their incredible history and, of course, their incredible success, consistently ranking among the best in the world. I think it's worth taking a brief look at this history uh, at this success, uh, demonstrating the tradition and the autonomy of our institutions. Uh, St Andrews was founded in 1413, only 602 years old, uh, by a group of Augustine masters, mainly graduates of Paris, initiating a school of higher studies in the town. And then, of course, our next oldest university, Glasgow, was founded in 1451, and the students of today walk in the footsteps of some of the world's most renowned innovators, from John Logie Baird to the best-selling author of The Times, Adam Smith, and his book, The Wealth of Nations. Then a relative newcomer, Aberdeen, founded in 1495, to train doctors, teachers and clergy for the communities of northern Scotland and lawyers and administrators to serve the, the Scottish uh, Crown. And as many uh, MSPs will remember, this Parliament sat in Aberdeen when we used to be evicted for a week each year from our old place for the General Assembly. And then the newcomer Edinburgh, founded in 1583, has played host to scientists, philosophers and politicians who have shaped the modern world. Edinburgh graduates signed the United States Declaration of Independence, founded Ivy League universities and wrote some of the world's most widely read books. So Scotland's long and distinguished tradition of first-class higher education continues with four of our universities ranked in the top 200 uh, of the world, which, as you will all agree, is no mean achievement. And, of course, we remain a popular destination for academics from all corners of the world, exceeding in research, ranging from Peter Higgs' eponymous boson to Aberté's burgeoning gaming industry and considerable world-renowned health research. So we should be rightly proud of our traditions and ensure that this stellar work continues. We have unprecedented levels of entrance to higher education despite budget constraints and we can hold our head high in terms of research, UK-wide, EU-wide and worldwide. But we, uh, uh, there has been something happening in terms of governance that few speakers have mentioned. And that is that university government, governance was recently modernised through the new Scottish Code of Good Higher Education Governance 2013. In fact, a review of the new code last year reported that after only one year, the achievements of the new framework include five out of six new appointments of chairs are women mm -hmm. on merit, 42% of new appointments of independent governing body members are women, there is improved accountability and the inclusion of students and staff on nomination committees for principals and chairs. So the need for further action and interference is quite unclear, given the positive moves achieved through the new code and indeed achieved by improved working between universities and the Scottish Government. And I'm sure members will understand that after one year, uh, we can make some judgments, but many places on the boards are for three to four years and we'll have to wait until they've fulfilled their term of office before replacements can come forward. But surely the principle of academic freedom is fundamental to higher academic institutions. I make no apology for uh, repeating, as Liz Smith said, the OECD conducted studies across Europe 
and found a direct correlation between institutional autonomy and the quality of the institution. Furthermore, the Royal Society of Edinburgh's Higher Education Governance response to the Scottish Government contends that the Scottish Government proposals to interfere in university governments are, and I quote, inappropriate, unnecessary and potentially counter to good governance. I hope the reassurance we've had today from the Cabinet Secretary that she has listened, she has taken on board many of the views. I hope that that will go some way to allaying these fears. Of course, we are in favour of legislation to address problems and we will always seek to improve and make things better in terms of the public spend or to further positive viable outcomes. But we do not see our universities as a problem. We don't see them as broken. We don't see them as needing additional bureaucracy or interference from politicians as they are clearly excelling for centuries uh, as they are. So I hope that the Cabinet Secretary will take on the board the many contributions that have been raised today and, like the rest of us, ensure that the success of Scottish universities will continue. Many thanks. That concludes the debate on Scotland's universities and it's now time to move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 13312 in the name of Liz Smith on nursery vouchers. Could I invite members who wish to participate, please press the request to speak buttons now. Unfortunately, we've already had to inform a member who wished to speak that there will not be time to call them and therefore I ask members to keep to their time because we are still short of time. I call on Liz Smith to speak to and move the motion maximum 10 minutes. Please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And uh, can I move the motion in my name? On the 20th of November last year, in her first First Minister's questions, uh, Nicola Sturgeon gave a very firm commitment that her door would, and I quote, always be open to sensible policy discussion. And a month later, on the 11th of December, again at FMQs, she assured Ruth Davidson that she would listen to sensible suggestions from all opposition parties. Since that time, the Scottish Conservatives have tried on three separate occasions to ensure that the First Minister keeps that promise. And today, we will try again for the fourth time. And we will do so, to use the Cabinet Secretary for Education's line from her speech at Glasgow University two weeks ago, on the basis of what works and not from dogma or ideology. Presiding Officer, on Thursday last week, Ruth Davidson cited the case of Marissa, a single mother in Glasgow, who turned down three job offers because she could not find a nursery that could take her daughter during the hours which suited. A situation which we believe is not only unacceptable on educational and economic grounds, but is, which is directly contrary to the stated aims of the Scottish Government's social policy. While everyone in this Parliament supports the move from 475 to 600 hours provision, and of course the additional money which has been put in place to support that policy, we can surely never be content until all parents can access their entitlement. The issue is not so much about the number of hours on offer, but about parents' access to them and the current inflexibility of when these hours can be taken. The First Minister, whilst acknowledging the concerns of some parents about this issue, does not seem as yet to recognise that the situation cannot improve until there is a radically different approach. Additional hours are no use unless they can be properly accessed. So if I may, I want to spend a little time on the detail of the problem before I set out what we think can be the solution. In the first instance, the problem relates to the fact that neither the Scottish Government nor the local authorities seem able to provide the full facts. This is because data is weak or incomplete, or in some cases meaningless. For example, the Scottish Government is persisting in using what it describes the registration figure, which it believes shows a 98.5% uptake. Parents groups, however, are struggling to understand that statistic, given that the evidence on the ground shows something entirely different. It is their opinion, from the evidence that they have compiled, that the figure is closer, closer to an 80% uptake, which obviously tells us that one in five children, the problem is still acute. Fair Funding for Our Kids have looked at the 2014 nursery census to find that 2,802 children were registered in partnership providers in Glasgow, but in terms of the number of places, at the time it was only 2,089. In other words, 713 children are not receiving the funding that had actually been included in the registration statistics, which incidentally correlates with nearly 1.5 million worth of funding. 
Yes, of course. Pop Torres. I wonder if the member would agree with me that, agree with me that the Glasgow Second runs a system called the NAM system, which uh, registers any child at a partnership nursery where there is partnership funding places, irrespective of whether that child is actually in receipt of a partnership funding place. And Glasgow City Council have to get their, their, their ship in order in terms of counting the children accurately within the local authority area. Liz Smith. I think, the, I think that's only half the story, because I think uh, what registrations are also doing is to include children on waiting, on waiting lists, and they could actually be on more uh, than one uh, list. And so those children who don't actually quite have uh, the entitlement that they deserve, and so it's not an accurate, the registration figure is not an accurate reflection of the demand. And the fair funding for our kids' uh, statistics, and I know they've spoken to the uh, First Minister about this, is that 29 out of the 32 local authorities uh, have actually got registrations of three-year-olds that are above the 100%. And that obviously tells you that there is uh, a serious problem. And just to come back uh, to the uh, Glasgow situation, the 47 partnership nurseries in Glasgow, 873 children out of uh, 1,600 eligible children received their entitlement in West Lothian. Uh, it was 23 partnerships that were looked at and only uh, 335 out of 673 eligible had their funding. So, you know, the, these statistics, which have been compiled uh, very methodically, I have to say, by parents' groups, I, I think uh, tell uh, quite a lot about the story. And, of course, the Scottish Government is facing criticism uh, from local authorities who are clear that they do not actually have enough money to make the necessary provision for the additional places because the fa fatal mistake has been made of thinking that as costs rise in the same proportion uh, to the additional hours provided. And that's actually uh, not correct, because the local authorities say uh, quite clearly that the Scottish Government is failing to recognise the need for additional staff and the additional infrastructure. And they quite rightly point out that, obviously, from August uh, later this year, the definition of the vulnerable two-year-olds uh, will, in fact, change. Thus, there is no chance uh, that local authorities will fulfil their statutory duties as uh, are set out in paragraph 159 of the Children and Young Peoples Act. And it says quite clearly there that the annual incremental increases in funding for the Scottish Government will enable education authorities to increase the flexibility and the choice on the annual basis. But that's simply uh, not happening. But this is, has an added detrimental effect because many providers are actually not receiving as much money as they need from the local authority. And therefore, they're pushing up the costs to the privately funded hours, making it more expensive for parents and, in some cases, defeating the purpose of the policy. And whilst uh, on the subject of choice, uh, can we just deal with the myth that private nurseries are making a profit? Because they most certainly are not. But what they are in the business of doing is to provide that additional flexibility that the state nurseries uh, cannot. For example, they are open for much longer uh, hours and they offer holiday cover. And let's also remember that for some families uh, using childminders and nannies, they're not able to access free hours at all. But the real issue for parents is this restriction of choice. Because we know that in Eastern Bartonshire, East Lothian, in Glasgow, they have all restricted the number of places that they can fund in partnership nurseries. Something which means that many parents are having to move their children from one nursery uh, to another if they can no longer get a funded place at that existing nursery. That's why many parents believe that thousands of children are missing out on the provision because the local authority nurseries are unable to provide the suitable hours for working parents. And I think, obviously, if it's a flagship uh, policy, Cabinet Secretary, it was a, a very uh, clear flag flagship policy before the referendum, then it's some flagship if thousands of children are not getting that entitlement. And there's also, of course, a very marked variation across Scotland in the allocation process, meaning that parents are often open to a lottery. Local authorities purchase partnership places using different procurement processes set against different criteria. For example, in Glasgow, geographical lots are drawn, giving the most places to nurseries which have the highest rating of five. And that has the potential to be a very good thing, I have to say, in terms of driving up standards, but not if the same practice is disapplied to other nurseries. Because it could mean that very good nurseries, which receive a rating of four, pretty good, but not quite a five in the area of the city with a high number of these, then obviously uh, they are going to lose out. So that is a system that is not fair. And again, that comes back to the evidence that has been provided by many uh, parents. Now, these issues combined make the current funding arrangements both restrictive and unfair. And of course, they are happening at the same time as the Scottish Government persists in its perverse logic which denies that all children born in the winter months have the same nursery provision afforded to those born in the summer months. 
The First Minister, when questioned on that, uh, First Minister's questions back in November, said that her commitment to ensuring that childcare was real, genuine and strong. Well, so far, nothing has happened, and that is patently uh, disingenuous. There is absolutely no equitable defence of that birthday discrimination, and again, I ask the Scottish Government uh, to have a look at it. Presiding officer, many times there has been consensual agreement in this Parliament about the importance of the early years and therefore the policies which surround them. But it is translating warm, warm words and manifest commitments into reality that we absolutely need. It is patently clear at the moment that we have the warm words, but we're actually very far away from the workable, workable policy which will allow all children to access their entitlement. Now, not for the first time in this Parliament, members have rejected a Scottish Conservative policy simply because it contains the word voucher. Final but let's be clear about this motion, because it reflects exactly what is happening in Edinburgh City Council, where the activation of a code given to the parent by the council allows the parent to access the necessary care. It's a virtual voucher, if you like, and it works because it allows the money to follow the child. And that's something that has been patented by an SNP and Labour-led council. So I hope that uh, out of dogma or any kind of ideology, it will not be uh, rejected. <coughs> Presiding officer, we see this as a hugely significant issue. Indeed, we will make it a priority manifesto commitment for 2016. Parents must have choice. They must have the flexibility and they must be able to have the entitlement that has been promised by the Scottish Government. Many thanks. I now call on Fiona MacLeod to speak to and to move Amendment 13312.3, maximum seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome this debate and I rise to speak to and move the amendment in my name. I welcome this debate as timely, only ten months after the commencement of this Government's huge commitment and huge growth to 600 hours of early learning and childcare. That's a 45% increase in the numbers of free hours of early learning and childcare for children since we came into government in 2007. The Scottish Government is committed to developing a high quality, flexible system of early learning and childcare that is affordable and accessible for all, focusing on those most in need in the first instance. We know that high quality early learning and childcare benefits children, especially those who are most in need, and can contribute to narrowing attainment and inequality gaps. We also know that lack of accessible and affordable childcare is a major concern for families and a barrier to work for many parents. Our aims are to improve outcomes for all children, especially those who are most disadvantaged, and to support parents to work, train or study especially those who need those routes into sustainable employment and out of poverty. The Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014 ensured that all three and four-year-olds are now legally entitled to 600 hours a year of funded early learning and childcare. The Children and Young People's Act also extended this entitlement to our vulnerable and disadvantaged two-year-olds. And in the Act, we created for the first time a statutory duty on lo local authorities to introduce flexibility and choice based on local consultation. Certainly. Liam MacArthur. The intervention very much welcome the, the steps that she's outlined. She'll be aware that while welcoming the moves in relation to um, disadvantaged two-year-olds and welcome the extension um, uh, applied this, uh, this summer to 27% of two-year-olds, we are very keen to see that um, rise to around 40%, similar to south of the border. Is there any update on when uh, the government expects that further extension to be achieved? Minister. As Mr MacArthur knows from our debate yesterday in uh, committee, the extension to 15% of two-year-olds last year and 27% of, of uh, two-year-olds this year is last year was to ensure that the children of parents who were out of work and this year the children of parents who are in low paid employment get the support that's needed and this is about a phased and sustainable support for the most vulnerable children in our society. So I know from, my, from going round uh, the local authorities and nurseries uh, in the last few months that local authorities are already consulting with and engaging parents and families to ensure the design and delivery of provision will be flexible enough to meet 
local parents' demands. And in fact, on my travels, I've already heard of local authorities providing extended hours uh, following the consultations. So the purpose of this legislation was also to set the stage for longer term expansion and improvement. And to that end, the First Minister announced a commitment to increasing the hours further to match those delivered in primary school by the end of the next Parliament. Liz Smith. Certainly. I thank her uh, for doing so. I just listened carefully to what you said uh, just now. Uh, the Minister gave me a parliamentary response uh, recently. And when you said that the model uh, for adapting the uh, actual spend from the government uh, was the same model that had been used for the, when it was the 475 hours. Uh, could the Minister just explain where she believes that there is sufficient funding to do exactly what she's just outlined? Minister. If I can refer to uh, Ms Smith to the written parliamentary answer that I gave her, and, and you're right, it's, we took the work that we did last year with COSLA and our providers to upscale to 600 hours and then upscale that to uh, the, the further hours that we're looking for in the future. So that was all there in the parliamentary answer. Um, so can I talk about introducing, you know, when we introduced the 600 hours uh, last year and with the extension again this year, that was challenging timescales and we absolutely understand that. And I think we have to look at this debate in the context of those additional hours, additional children and additional flexibility. And in that con context, say that it is reasonable to expect that an increase in flexibility and choice will be achieved in a phased and sustainable basis on a year by year uh, growth. So also I think it's important to say that the Scottish Government fully founded, funded this groundbreaking policy with a £329 million committed over the first two years of its implementation, a figure arrived at with our delivery partners in local government. We're, also, we're talking about early learning and childcare, and part of that is important in uh, supporting women back into work. And we have already begun to see some of the results of that, with figures just recently say, showing us that Scotland now has the lowest rate of female unemployment of any country in Europe, whilst the female employment in Scotland is at a record level, and the gap between male and female employment is at a near record low. So the Conservatives have suggested that one way to increase flexibility is to let parents have vouchers. However, I think we need to consider such a decision and ensure that that, that decision is made so that we can manage our education system to be the best that it can be for our youngest children. We need to consider that policy, whether we think that a market-led consumer approach to purchasing early learning and childcare will guarantee sufficient quality, will guarantee an integration with our education system and with the curriculum for excellence, and will guarantee integration with policy objectives such as getting it right for every child. Because Education Scotland and the Care Inspectorate are there to uh, inspect and ensure quality within our providers and to help them to improve their provision. So can I finish, presiding officer, by saying that we have committed to extending universal early learning and childcare to 30 hours a week by the end of the next parliament. And we believe, and I hope that everyone would believe, that we should test these proposals for early learning and childcare against the principle of high quality support to our youngest children to give them the best start in life. Thank you very much. I now call on Cara Hilton to speak to and move Amendment 13312.2, maximum five minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Um, transforming childcare is certainly one of the most important challenges we face, and as a mum of three young children myself, it's an issue close to my heart. So I welcome the opportunity to speak in the debate and the mo to move this amendment in my name. Last night, alongside the Minister, I, attend I attended the launch of One Parent Family Scotland's programme for change, and at the heart of the priorities identified by the single parents was the need to transform childcare to make sure it's high quality, flexible and affordable, to enable parents to work and study while also meeting the development needs of children and to address the inequalities that continue to impact on children's life chances. Earlier this year, it was revealed by the Family and Childcare Trust that 15% of councils in Scotland 
Only 15 per cent of councils in Scotland have enough childcare capacity to meet the needs of working parents. This compares with 43 per cent in England. And one of the biggest challenges right now, as Liz Smith has already outlined, outlined is that many thousands of children are missing out on the 600 hours early education they are entitled to right now. We often hear in the Chamber about the apparent 98.5 per cent take-up of free places, but this simply does not reflect the reality on the ground. And to quote directly from the Fair Funding for Kids campaign, they say that for many children, a working parents, the system is not delivering a model of childcare that meet the, meets the needs of the modern working family. Right now, thousands of families across Scotland are unable to access their legal entitlement to free childcare because most council nurseries do not offer suitable hours for work, working parents. For parents who work full time, access in a free space that is only available for three hours and ten minutes a day for 38 weeks a year simply is not an option. Um, how many children across Scotland are being offered places that are just so inflexible that working parents can't access them? How many children are unable to access their 600 hours at all because they attend a private nursery and all the fund and place, funded places have been allocated? How many children are attending nurseries that aren't partnership providers, so there's just no money available at all to fund their place? And how many children are attending a preschool nursery but not benefiting for the full 600 hours? Because the provision simply doesn't fit in with the school day, and that poses a problem for parents of children at school too. Minister. While not denying, Ms Hilton, that, that we haven't got full flexibility into the system as yet, would Ms Hilton agree with me that we're 10 months in and, we're, and we ha this is a huge programme of improvement which we want to roll over to 2020 and we're Cara, doing not bad already. Cara Hilton. Uh, I mean, yes, um, but the, the reality is this was a, a promise that was pledged back in, tw in 2007. I think that's plenty of time to get it right. Um, and the reality is that parents are missing out. Uh, and the answer, the answer to the questions that I've asked before is that we can only speculate because no one actually knows how many parents are missing out in the 600 hours that are a universal for every, right for every child in Scotland because we've got no national oversight or scrutiny of this flagship policy to make sure that it's been delivered and to ensure the spirit of the Act is being fulfilled. And that's why Scottish Labour is calling for effective national oversight of this policy to ensure that it does work for every child. And we want to see a full audit too of how the policy is being delivered across each local authority. Because right now, too many parents feel that they are being robbed of their rights. They want to see action to ensure that the ch their children receive the childcare they have been promised, not a promise of change in the future when their children will probably be at school. Um, we support much of Liz Smith's motion, although, um, like um, the Fiona McLeod, we do not accept that the introduction of our virtual voucher scheme is necessarily the way, the way forward. But we do agree with the Fair Funding for Kids campaign and with the Forum Scotland that all... Yeah, Liz Smith, briefly. D does the member accept that in Edinburgh Council, Labour and SNP led, that that is exactly what's happening? Does she support that? Cara Hilton, you're approaching your last minute. Yeah. Um, oh, that may well be the case, but uh, it's just the idea of the concept of vouchers for public services. Um, I think it could be a slippery slope. So I think it maybe needs to be, have more discussion, but it's certainly not an idea that we're supporting today. Um, in respect of the amendment table by Fiona McLeod, we are going to be abstaining on the basis that we don't accept that the 600 hours policy is fully funded. Local authorities are telling us that they don't have the resources to deliver it fully for the reasons that Liz Smith outlined earlier. We are also sceptical of the claim that more women with three and four year olds are re-entering the labour market thanks to a three hours a day childcare policy. I certainly don't know of many jobs that fit around a three hours, ten minute nursery place. Um, our amendment highlights the observations in the Commission for the Childcare Reforms interim report that the focus on three and four year olds has not been matched with a coordinated investment in the needs of working families for preschool childcare, out of school childcare and holiday provision. And so in, well, in debates, today's debate we're rightly calling for the Scottish Government to take steps now to ensure that 600 hours is a reality for every child. We know that this doesn't fix the childcare challenges that Scotland's Faces. These are challenges that don't begin when a child is three, they don't end when a child starts school, um, and the spiralling cost of childcare is a huge headache for working parents. Unfortunately, I've totally run out of time to that, thanks to all these interventions. Um, can I just conclude by saying, um, given a quote from the Fair Funding for Kids campaign, what they say is that nobody has got a grip of childcare policy. Promises of 30 hours in the future would sound a lot more convincing to parents if parents were actually receiving the 15 hours they're entitled to now. Uh, we've got to ensure a better deal for parents right across Scotland. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. We turn to the open debate. We are very tight for time. Four minute speeches, please. Could members please check the press to request to speak buttons. Bob Doris to be followed by Liam MacArthur. 
Thank you, President Officer, for the opportunity to uh, speak in this debate. I have met on a number of occasions with the Fair Funding for Our Kids campaign and have engaged directly with many of the issues that they raise. Um, I have to say, I think both uh, Cara Hilton and Liz Smith have been a bit churlish in not recognising the, the huge increases that have been in childcare provision across Scotland. And because of the time constraints we have, I wouldn't list through all of those achievements that there have been. There Mr quite... Doris, could you pull your microphone up? I'm having difficulty hearing. Thank you. Uh, that's not usually something I'm told, Presiding Officer. I, I'm happy to speak louder. Um, that, I, I have to say that significant and profound advances in childcare provision right across Scotland. But where I do concede that, uh, uh, is where, of course, we have to go further and we have to provide more choice and we have to provide more flexibility. I just say it's churlish not to suggest there hasn't been substantial, significant and sustained improvement right across Scotland. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I think that is not reflected in the motion or the amendment that uh, is, is before us uh, today. Uh, I want to raise some of the points Fair Funding for Our Kids ha ha have mentioned. Uh, they talk about over a thousand children in Glasgow not accessing the entitlement uh, that they're entitled to. They've identified uh, limitations in, this, in Glasgow's childcare structures and, and, and uh, how uh, working parents, fathers, not just mothers, I have to say to our front bench spokespersons uh, this afternoon, uh, accessing uh, five half day placements across the course of a week and needing to block those together, for example, so you get two and a half days solid where you have childcare arrangements by the local authority or partnership nurse rather than spread over five days. That's not something that Glasgow City Council has been particularly good at doing. They also have under 2,000 extended places within the city and there is a need for more. So, of course, there's problems there. Things are improving, but of course there's issues there. And I have to say the old local authority model of going to the local school nursery may not fit in with the uh, working patterns as they are today. Sometimes mothers and fathers need to use the nursery close to where grand stays or close to where their work is or where a former partner stays as part of a joint parenting strategy or close to the primary school that a sibling is in because they use the breakfast clubs there. I think on that, that basis I should put on record I'm ra rather worried about Glasgow City Council seeking to close breakfast clubs right across the city which will have a direct uh, childcare impact and uh, anti-poverty strategy impact on, on, on my constituents. Uh, there is guidance, of course, in relation to uh, the statute duty to make a place available um, for, um, for, for each child, and that, that should, of course, be flexible, but perhaps we have to tease out more about what a reasonable offer should look like. The, the offer is not always going to be a nursery place round the corner from your place of employment or round the corner from, your, for, from the gran or from a former partner or whatever, but there should be the offer of a reasonable place. And there is a concern. Final minute. So there is a concern, presiding officer, that sometimes local authorities, particularly Glasgow, in this instance, would rather see a, a local authority nursery place sit empty in order to save cash rather than fund a partnership nursery place. And we have to look at how we scrutinise and how we put pressure on them. I'd like to raise an issue in Glasgow City Council where a lot of parents from the Fair Funding for Our Kids uh, actually went to a partnership nursery quite deliberately for their two-year-olds on the expectation and the hope that there would be a place there for when their child turned three. But Glasgow City Council had a procurement strategy which actually withdrew places from those partnership nurseries when, uh, for when the children reached three and no place was able to be offered. And I think that was just wrong and they have to get better at doing that. Could you draw uh, to a close, please? Yes, I, I'll draw to a close by saying vouchers are not the way to do it. The funding should always follow the child, but we do have to significantly increase partnership nursery places. And we don't need legislation for this, because if Labour and the SNP can sorry, do this jointly in Edinburgh, then we can do it right across Scotland. I'm afraid I'm, we'll have to cut members off if they don't keep to four minutes. Liam MacArthur to be followed by James Dornan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy <laughs> President. Officer. Can I uh, start by thanking uh, Mary Scanlon for her very generous remarks about the sudden and untimely death of Charles Kennedy was uh, a gifted politician, a liberal to his core, and a Highlander first and last. Uh, for my part, uh, I had the privilege of being able to call him a friend, but I know his passing is mourned by those across the political spectrum and far beyond. Deputy President Officer, the, the Minister is well aware that we share her aspiration for a revolution in childcare. At consecutive budgets, we've pushed for extended provision 
for two-year-olds. Uh, as a result, 27% of Scotland's two-year-olds will, as the Minister confirmed, benefit. Uh, this is good, but uh, I am concerned that it still lags behind the 40% of those from disadvantaged, disadvantaged backgrounds who benefit uh, elsewhere in the UK. I hope that the next phase of this revolution will see more of Scotland's two-year-olds uh, getting access to these opportunities. There is, after all, overwhelming evidence that investment in the first few years of a child's life is crucial in shaping their life chances. Investment in childcare later on is welcome, uh, but addressing, if addressing the attainment gap and reducing inequalities to be achieved, this requires ruthless focus on investment in quality learning and childcare in the very early years. It's an argument that I have made many times before and make no apologies for doing so again today. As we look at future provision, however, we must make sure that what happens now is of high quality and meets the needs both of children and their parents, that it is not simply determined by the constraints of local government. And, and key to achieving that is, as others have said, increasing flexibility, and flexibility that I think by the government's own admission is not yet available in the way we would like. Across Scotland, delivery of the current childcare offering is sketchy. Some Scot uh, councils offer partnership arrangements to many nurseries which fit with parents' uh, wishes. Others are more cautious uh, and limit some of them severely the partnership funding and partnership status. And I would encourage the Minister to see what more can be done to encourage councils to provide genuine flexibility through an increase in the number of partnership nurseries, taking into account the wishes and needs of parents. Briefly, in the time available uh, to me this afternoon, I want to address something which isn't contained in the motion or indeed the amendments, but which is obviously key to the success of childcare and early learning in Scotland, and that is uh, the workforce. The pressure on those working in the sector has inevitably increased uh, through the expansion in entitlement. With further expansions on the horizon, we must ensure that Scotland has the early years workforce it needs to provide first-class care and education for our children. That means training more specialists as well as ensuring that those already working in the sector remain content in their careers and equipped to deal with the new demands we are placing upon them. Final minute. I understand that uh, a review is underway. Uh, it would be helpful perhaps in her uh, closing remarks if the Minister could update the Parliament on the progress with that review and when we might expect uh, recommendations to emerge from it. Uh, Presiding officer, I too, like others, welcome the fact that we are continuing to have this focus on early learning and nursery provision. There is, I think, cross-party support for more hours of high-quality childcare, but there is a long way to go before the delivery catches up with our aspirations, and that is something we must be aware of and work quickly and creatively to resolve. Thank you very much indeed. Many thanks. I now call James Dornan to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, over the last month, I have had a considerable number of parents upset and disheartened by the way Glasgow City Council have dealt with the partnership nurseries in Glasgow. The Council has to recognise that the needs of many parents and children cannot be met by local authority-run nurseries and should be doing much more to ensure a wider availability of nursery provision. There seems to have been an arbitrarily dropping of funding from one year to the next for no apparent reason in many of the partnership nurseries in my constituency and I suspect across the city. In a matter of different types of nurseries and nursery provision, I want to talk about the great work that Castleton Nursery and Castlemill are doing as a community-led nursery. In 2007, Castleton Stables transferred from council to community ownership and has since developed into a facility which hosts community events, offices, training suites and, of course, the nursery. This nursery opens five days a week from 7.30am until 6pm, including public holidays is available for all and is open during the vast majority of people's working hours, solving the problem which a lot of parents have with part-time nurseries, which are found to only to be open for a section of the day, making it, as we've already heard, impossible for parents to either drop their child off or pick them up, as these times will likely clash with their working hours. Any child from just six weeks old up to the age of five can attend a nursery and enjoy opportunities to develop their social skills and take part in a wide range of activities under the supervision of the excellent, professional, highly qualified staff which run the organisation, led ably by their manager, Susan Palmer. Castleton Stables Nurseries is the only nursery in Glasgow to provide a forest kindergarten for children aged three and under. This initiative works in partnership with the Forestry Commission, who have helped to train the staff as well as participating in activities such as walks in the forest, setting up camp, building dens and balancing on logs, and, if there's time, sitting down for a quick drink and a snack. One of the key aspects of this nursery is flexibility. 
flexibility for parents who use it, as well as an ability to react to local circumstances. I thoroughly believe that Castleton Nursery is a great example of a community-led nursery and a model that I think could be usefully utilised across Glasgow and across the country as a whole. This flexibility inherent in Castleton is unfortunately lacking a lot of the work that Glasgow City Council, in my case, but in particular, are doing. Many of the constituents who contact me have been turned down for a place in a partnership nursery because the council won't fund that place. Yet, the fund, as we've heard, the funding is being made available from the Scottish Government. Instead, they're only offering a place in a nursery which might not be suited to the parents and, crucially, the children for a whole number of reasons. These services must be run for the benefit of children and parents, not for the convenience of the council. This is why I welcome the provisions in the Children and Young People Act, which has introduced a statutory responsibility for local authorities to consult parents about the required flexibility in nursery provision, as well as a commitment to look further into how we gather data around this to ensure an increasing level of flexibility and choice. From discussion with parents, it's clear that flexibility is key in nursery provision. Final minute. Presiding officer, we know there are examples of good practice on this around the country, such as Edinburgh and Dumfries and Galloway councils. And much like taking lessons from the good practice of Castleton Nursery, I'd implore Glasgow City Council in particular to investigate how they tender for partnership places and the number that they offer to parents. If Glasgow City Council started looking at statutory duties to provide nursery places in a different way that was more reflective of the needs of parents and children across the city, I know this would have a hugely positive impact. The funding is there from the Scottish Government to do so. The want is there from the parents to look into this mo more. And the benefits to children across Cathcart and Glasgow more broadly are huge. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed um, by Martin Fraser. I um, welcome the uh, government's 600 hour policy and their ongoing work to deliver it more flexibly. But I also support uh, much of the uh, Conservative motion, although I did have a bout of deja vu and I saw the words nursery vouchers uh, at the top of it because, of course, before the 1997 election, this was a major point of controversy. And I even managed to find my speech of the 29th of January 1996, winding, out, winding up the Scottish Grand Committee, which had been introduced by uh, Michael Forsyth. I, I, I'll spare you the contents of that speech, but I, I'm a bit mystified why they, they want to revisit those words, because clearly a virtual voucher is a bit different from the real thing, so I think it would have been wise uh, not to use that word at all. One of the things I did say in that speech, speech is, was to emphasise quality, and I will talk about what Edinburgh does, because Edinburgh has been uh, uh, mentioned several times in the debate, and whether they're virtual vouchers or not, I really haven't got a clue, but I do rather uh, uh, admire what Edinburgh is doing, because the starting point of their policy is quality. They will only accept partnership nurseries if they meet strict quality criteria and uh, many do and uh, the cabinet secretary will expect me to mention North Edinburgh childcare because I always do in childcare debates they obviously are of the highest quality I should declare an interest I'm on the board now but they obviously uh, meet the criteria as do many others 40 percent of the provision in Edinburgh is from partnership uh, nurseries so I think uh, parents generally can get a place in such a nursery uh, if it suits them. There is actually a problem which I heard about recently which surprised me about the funding arrangements for that because apparently Edinburgh also ends up paying for um, children from uh, West Lothian, East Lothian and Mid Lothian, which I, I think they're working on solving that, but I was rather surprised that that happened. So I think the problem in Edinburgh, in fact, is not a too little partnership provision, but actually in some cases too little council provision. But again, I should pay tribute to the council because they are on the case. Uh, as we speak, they're building a new uh, nursery at Wardy Primary School in my constituency, and I know there are similar building works in other part of the city uh, with which I am not so familiar. And also they're working uh, on developing more flexible options. One that I heard of, I don't know how attractive it will be to how many parents, was to have two days uh, where you get all your hours uh, in two days, all your entitlement in two days. So that's being piloted. As I say, I don't know how many people will find that uh, attractive. But because of the, um, the, 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 the need for more capacity in the council se uh, sector, it does mean that there are actually some children who are not uh, getting um, uh, who are only getting one year in a council nursery. And if you think about it, some parents um, 
um, only want that, that provision because perhaps they're working part-time or not working at all, and, you, and it's not possible to get in a partnership nursery the, just the 600 hours. So uh, there is a problem, and particularly uh, for children minute. born after the 3rd of August, often uh, some nurseries, I know and I can think of at least one in my constituency, which tends to fill up in August, because that's when everybody's left uh, in the summer, and then getting a place throughout the year is difficult. And of course, that compounds the problem that uh, Liz Smith uh, reminded us of in her speech, as she's done before, uh, for anyone three after August, because even in, even in the best of circumstances, they do not get two years of nursery education. So if you're born in November, you get uh, five months, and um, um, that's the best scenario. If you're born in January, you get four months, that's the best scenario. Remembering, as I've said, that some are only going to get uh, three, month, uh, three, uh, th uh, three uh, terms because of... Th did I say months there? I meant terms if I said months. Some are only going to get three terms because of the problem I described. So I do have a worry that uh, there are some children going into primary school, and it's the youngest ones who are only four, are also the ones who've had the least nursery education. There is a double disadvantage there. I'm not actually sure what the solution is, but I think we ought to be aware of the problem. Many thanks. And I call Mudro Fraser to be followed by George Adam. Thank you. Um, my colleague Liz Smith opened this debate referring to the statistic from the Family and Child Care Trust, whose research showed that just 15% of local authorities in Scotland had enough nursery places for parents who worked full time. That is simply not good enough. Now, governments both at Westminster and here in Edinburgh talk a great deal about the benefits of flexible childcare. We now have record employment levels, something we should all be proud of. But there are still too many parents who want to work or work longer hours than they are currently doing who are held back by a lack of childcare places and inflexibility in the system. And despite all the promises being made by the Scottish Government about increasing the level of provision, a promise which is welcome in itself, these words will appear to be hollow if they cannot sort out the inadequacies in the existing arrangements. Now, I've got some personal experience of these issues as the parent of two young children, both now at primary school and both recently at nursery. And our experience was a positive one because our local council engages with partnership providers. As a result, we were able to choose the nursery we wanted for our children. We chose one close to where we lived, one which had an excellent reputation, and one where we were impressed with both staff and management. And our experience was entirely positive. And I would say to the Minister, there is no evidence of poor standards or inadequate curriculum development. And if parents choose their nurseries properly, we won't face these problems. But I know that too many other parents are not so lucky because rather than having the right to choose and flexibility, they are left having to take the, the children uh, to the nursery place the local authority provides. And they are left with the inflexible hours on offer, which means trying to fit childcare into the working is virtually impossible. Flexible childcare permission for us meant that our children could attend nursery three days per week on a full-time basis. But as Cara Hilton pointed out earlier, too many other parents are left in a situation where they are offered a block of three hours per day, either 9 to 12 in the morning or 1 to 4 in the afternoon, five days a week. And there are very few jobs, if any, a working parent could do that fit in with that childcare pattern. So if, if we are to have proper support for working parents and allow parents to take up employment opportunities, then we have to have flexibility. Now, I, I would, because I've only got two minutes left, if the member will forgive me. Liz Smith referred to the fact that at least three local authorities, uh, Eastern Bartonshire, East Lothian and Glasgow, have restrictions on the number of places funded in partnership nurseries. This causes real headaches for working parents and this needs to change. And that's precisely why we're calling for more flexible arrangements and virtual vouchers. I would say to Malcolm, I don't really care what we call them. Uh, I think the principle is what is important, that we allow flexibility in the system because the current piecemeal approach is not working. Now, there is a second issue which needs to be addressed, and one, again, that we have raised on a consistent basis, and that is the issue of birthday discrimination. Final minute. And again, I can illustrate this from personal experience. My daughter was born in late August and was entitled to seven terms of funding for a nursery place. My son was born in January and was funded for just five terms. Now, on no level does this make any sense. We know there are substantial benefits from early childhood education. We know the Scottish Government promotes the concept of two years nursery provision for preschool children, but in reality, very few children actually get the full two years of funding. And when Liz Smith attempted to amend this in the Children and Young Persons Scotland Bill, every party in this chamber, bar the SNP, supported her. So the SNP talk a good game on nursery provision. 
They talk about fairness, but what they are doing is defending a system which is inherently unfair, which discriminates against children born in the first six months of the year. This costs parents and does nothing to spread the benefit of early years education to those who need it. But I think, officer, this is not an area where more powers are needed. It's an area where action could be taken today. We need flexibility close, for working please. parents, and we need to end the unfair birthday discrimination. Thank you. Thank you. George Adam, to be followed by Alec Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome this debate as it gives us an opportunity to discuss the ongoing progress made by the Scottish Government in nursery provision for families across Scotland. And also, we've got the situation where we must work with local government to deliver this policy. Now, I've come at this debate as a former councillor and MSP, so I've seen both sides of the argument uh, when you have, as a local councillor, to have to deliver government policy. But surely, we've heard much about councils that can actually deliver the policy and councils that don't. Is there surely a way that we can actually work to ensure that all the councils do find out the best practice to move forward? Because as one of the things that uh, I'm was quite frankly, presiding officer, sick of hearing as a councillor, was hearing how they were going to actually share practice with other local authorities, best practice and ways forward. And I think this is a perfect example of how we should take what is good in certain areas and move it elsewhere, because I know we all want to move towards that. But as the, the minister's already said, that the government, since the government came to power, there's been a 45% increase in necessary entitlement from three to four-year-olds from 412.5 hours in 2007 to 600 hours in 2014. And the fact that the Children and Young People's Act set to expand free childcare provision and increase flexibility year on year. Now, this investment is very important for our children's future. That is why the Scottish Government is looking to expand this further. We must ensure that we work with our partners in local government to ensure that, current deliver, uh, to ensure that this can be delivered. But at the same time, we must continue to look to the future because we must develop this further and provide further support for Scotland's families. Childcare is expensive, but what it delivers is priceless. The Scottish Government is looking to the future and they have already pledged that the SNP uh, 2016 manifesto will set out a plan to increase childcare provision by the end of the next Parliament from 16 hours to 30 hours per week. The First Minister went on to move to increase free early uh, learning and childcare provision to 30 hours as one of the best investments any government can possibly make. And by, I think the Minister already mentioned this as well, by 2019-20 uh, annual review spend on early learning and childcare will have increased from an anticipated £439 million this year to around £880 million. As I have already said, President Officer, you know, childcare is not cheap, but it is worth to make this investment because I think we're all agreed by this very debate that this is important to families throughout the country. Because this there is also going to be a promise of a, a additional extra capital spending by the Scottish, Scottish Government. And the First Minister made it clear that if re-elected, the great infrastructure project of the next Parliament will be investment in care and learning facilities to ensure our early years provision matches our primary school provision. Final now, minute. This is ambitious, President. Officer, and this shows the way forward that we can do. You know, we've looked at various, the big uh, capital spends of the past couple of uh, administrations have been big, massive bridges, have been roads, have been infrastructure. You know, this uh, may be less visible than the Queensbury crossing. It may not be as sexy as a nice, shiny new bridge. But at the end of the day, what the difference that this can make to the start of our young people's lives and giving families the support they need and ensuring that women get the opportunity to go back to work, all of these are absolutely priceless and will show that Scotland leads the way in childcare. Many thanks. And the last open debate speaker is Alec Riley. Thank you, President Officer. The amendment from Fiona MacLeod says that we should recognise that under the, the progress that's been made, is more than under any previous administration and you would you would want to think so given that the current government have been in power for over eight years but i would readily acknowledge the progress that has been made during that period of time um, what i would say is that a couple of points one is that this this brief from fair funding for our kids asks for a place at the table and i heard the minister on the BBC Radio this morning saying that local authorities have got to consult 
and consult with parents. And so a place at the table, it seems to me, is something that I would be very supportive of for parents to be able to have and representatives in every local authority area. I also heard Liz Smith this morning talking about the Edinburgh example, and I certainly will follow that up and ask um, Edinburgh so that we can look at that example. But I think for me it ties back to that in each local authority area, um, the local authorities should be engaged more. The minister on the BBC talked about working alongside COSLA, and COSLA no doubt has a role, but actually if we are serious about delivering a lot of these services, then the more localised we can actually go and work with local authorities. And each authority no doubt will come up with different solutions. So if, if Edinburgh is an example of best practice, then we should be highlighting that to other local authorities so that they can look at that. But crucially, at that local level, you would then be engaging with parents and ensuring that parents, I would have to say as, as, as a granddad, when, when my granddaughter went to nursery, uh, it was a mix and match, uh, the council, private nursery, and, and, and uh, myself and, 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 and our gran that, that was able to provide that childcare. And I did recognise and see how difficult it is for working parents and how costly it can be for working parents. And it's a real barrier. I had a a group of parents in here uh, earlier today from Inverkeaden and they were talking about the flexibility and the need for, for more flexibility. In Fife's case, I think what they moved was they went an extra half hour in the morning, so it started at 8.30 and an extra half hour in the afternoon. That is causing some difficulty for, for parents who have kids at school. Um, but Moving beyond that, there's no doubt that, the, as it currently is set up, councils are not set up to support um, a lot of working parents that work different hours. One of the parents that was in here today pointed out to me that a lot of jobs these days require weekend working, require evening working, and she was a single parent and was talking about how the major barrier for her going into employment is the lack of affordable, accessible childcare. So, so it is, of course, a major issue. I would just finish by saying that the other area that we need to look at with local authorities is the capacity within the local authorities so that there will be different alternatives. If we had been able to purchase that childcare within the local authority, we would have probably went for that option. There was not the capacity there to do that. But I would urge that uh, through a localism agenda, working with local authorities, then we can achieve the objectives that I believe the Scottish Government are trying to achieve. Many thanks. That then brings us to the closing speeches. And I call on Mark Griffin. Four minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Um, a lot of the comments in the debate this afternoon have focused on the campaign run by Fair Funding for our kids who are highlighting um, the difficulties parents are having in accessing their, their very welcome um, legal entitlement um, to 600 hours of free childcare. Um, they have highlighted the need for an audit of the spending in this area, which is, is not insignificant, as George Haddam um, pointed out from the figures that we spent today and the figures that we're projected to spend going forward. And I think that when we hear about the problems some parents are, are facing and the importance of this policy to young families, then that call is one the government should, should listen to. Mr Griffin, could you pull your microphone very slightly forward? Thank you. They've, they've flagged up um, the issue as pointed in the opening speech by Liz Smith um, with registration figures, um, which I think have been used to show um, an overwhelming success story with uptake, but, um, but they feel that that masks an underlying issue of children not accessing their legal entitlement. The, the Scottish Government uses registration statistics from the annual Early Learning and Childcare Census to assess uptake of funded places, but fair funding for our kids believes that that method in a quote is grossly overestimating the number of children in receipt of their entitlement. And they've stated, as pointed out earlier, that um, where the government suggests that less than 2% are not receiving their entitlement, that they believe the, the actual figure is closer to 20% not receiving that entitlement. And in their briefing for today's debate, they set out the reasons for this statement where partnership provider registrations 
include all children attending partner providers, regardless of whether or not funding has been allocated by the local authority, and gave the example of Glasgow, where according to the 2014 census, there were 2,802 children registered in partner providers, but the number of funded places awarded at the time of the census was 2,089. That means that 713 children who were not receiving funding have been included in that registration figures in one local authority alone. I take the point Bob Doris makes on his intervention and local authorities getting their house in order. But I think the big question is, is why are the government using those registration figures to calculate the uptake of entitlement when we all accept um, that that is not the case when there is a disparity of over 700. I think that, that um, calls into question the statistical accuracy of, of uptake. Final minute. Um, President officer, uh, despite um, the 600 hours um, being a, a universal right for, for every child in Scotland, as Car Hilton had said, I think there is no effective oversight at a national level to ensure this is this has been delivered. Um, I think that's why we are calling um, for that effective oversight of this policy to ensure that it works for every child. We support the call uh, for a full audit for from fair funding for our kids of how this policy is being delivered and we want to see action now to see to ensure that every child receives the funding that they are entitled to. Thank you. Many thanks. And to now call on Fiona MacLeod, Minister, up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Quite a lot to cover in that debate. But can I say at the outset, a ve I think a very useful debate, and I think the, the tone and temper of this debate shows that everybody in this chamber and across all the parties understands how important early learning and childcare is, not just for our young people, but for our economy and to support parents, but especially uh, women into work. Can I go through a number of the items that were raised by a number of people and try and answer them, if I can, in the short time that I've got? Um, Liz Smith, Cara Hilton, Mark Griffin, almost everybody mentioned about data and the data collection. Um, now, I think it has to, we have to... I'm not going to justify everything that we're doing here. And I'm going to answer the question, but I think I have to start by saying... In September every year, we do an annual census, um, which is a well-established method of counting heads in educational establishments. And a lot of the figures about the 1,000 here and the 800 there that don't have places are based on results from just two councils. So I think we have to th use our figures carefully, but from both ends of the argument, I will accept that. I will also accept... Liz Smith. I agree with uh, some of uh, what the Minister has just said. Notwithstanding that, uh, would uh, the Minister accept that the actual registration uh, definition is not actually accurate? Minister? I think, I think what, what I have to say is that everybody's clear that, we're, that our, our statistics are not robust for any side of this argument. And, it is, and there is variability across councils, never mind on either side of the argument. And it is something that the First Minister has charged the Chief Statistician with having a look at how we go about this. But also, um, I can tell you that on the 11th of June, how many days away is that, the statutory guidance group that we set up in, to um, take through the statutory guidance to support the Children and Young People Act will be talking about this at their meeting on the 11th of June and that is a, a group that have been working together to deliver this for a long time so in just a few days we will start to really think about this in much greater detail. Funding, I really, you know, Liz Smith and Cara Hilton said that we, it's not fully funded. I really have to say to, to, to both of them that since 2000, for January 2014, when we set out our ambition to have 600 hours of childcare by, January, by August 2014, we have worked closely with CLOSLA and with our delivery partners to ensure that that 329 million funding we gave was what was agreed was needed. And we have continued to work with all our delivery partners 
until most recently when I was able to say at Education Committee tomorrow that the £600,000 that we estimate it will cost us to, to introduce uh, the 27% of two-year-olds, we have worked that figure out and we have budgeted for it and we have come to that. So we ha our work, the funding is well worked out with all our partners. Can I just say to Cara Hilton on timescale, she said that um, the 600 hours we'd had plenty of time to work on when I was, had been saying that I think 10 months is pretty good for you know, where we've got to already. It was in January 2014 that the former First Minister said that he would hope to see 600 hours by January, uh, by August 2014. So I think we have made great strides, but we were also determined, and we said at the time, that we would do this in a sustained and a, a sustainable and phased way. Flexibility is something that everybody's talking about. I have to reiterate what I said in my opening remarks. Flexibility must never be at the expense of quality. And we heard from James Dornan about the quality that Castleton Nursery can give, but the flexibility of your hours that it can give. We also heard from Murdo Fraser about his exceptionally good experience for his own children. And I would come back to flexibility must never be at the expense of quality and how can we ensure quality because we have regulators in the child the, the care inspectorate and education scotland to ensure that when we go as parents or when a local authority goes to look for partners that we can look at the registration uh, and regulation uh, experience and know with confidence that those nurseries will provide quality education and childcare for our youngest people. Final um, minute. Yeah, really, I'll really rush through things. Liam MacArthur, um, the CIRAJ report, uh, the Cabinet Secretary on the 1st of June, Monday this week, responded to the CIRAJ report on workforce development for childcare. She said that we will answer uh, all the recommendations by autumn this year, but she also announced £1 million to put into workforce development for the early, early years child co child care workforce. Um, can I just very briefly say that flexibility is not just about nurseries. We're working really hard to talk about employers being flexible employers. We're funding Family Friendly Working Scotland Partnership to say to employers, think about how you employ your, your families. Uh, much else that I wanted to talk about and really don't have time because I want to finish with, as I did in my opening remarks, I think today's debate has shown that there, we have more in common across the parties about our commitment to early, early education and childcare to ensure that every child in Scotland gets the best start possible. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And I now call on Mary Scanlon to wind up the debate. Mrs Scanlon, eight minutes until uh, just before five. Thank you, five. Presiding Officer. I would also like to thank all the speakers in the debate for their contribution. Uh, and I'm very pleased that uh, Fiona McLeod talked about what we had in common, because that's exactly what I would like to uh, start my speech with. Uh, I would like to look at what we all agree on. Uh, we agree with and welcome the Scottish Government pledge for a legal entitlement of 600 hours of free early learning and childcare. We all support proposals to extend universal free early learning and childcare to 30 hours a week for the school year by the end of the next parliamentary session. We all highly value the work done in our nurseries, as Liam MacArthur and others mentioned, along with the increased training for staff, as well as the quality-driven Care Inspectorate and Education Scotland regime. There is an issue of low pay for many staff in this sector, where historic low pay has prevailed, and this should be changing given the qualifications and training required, as well as meeting with the high Care Inspectorate uh, standards. The responsibility of assessing each and every child when they enter nursery, then to plan how to support and help that child throughout the year, then to evaluate the progress made is an exemplar model of identifying development issues and providing support in preparation for school. And we would all commend that. So all of this uh, we welcome and agree with. And we cannot even criticise the Scottish Government for not putting money in. But what we are focusing on today is how this policy is implemented. And can every child access the 600 hours of free childcare and the answer is no. 
For a start, the provision of free childcare is only available in many nurseries during term times, which does not suit most working parents with the normal statutory entitlement of holidays and public holidays, and even more difficult for single parents. Secondly, the 600 hours is not available in every nursery in Scotland, which means that for some parents, they would have to take their child to nursery, mainly council, offering the free childcare for three hours a day during term time, then pick them up after three hours and take them to a nursery that offered full day care. And I'm sure that all members will understand that this is just not practical from a work point of view, but it's also likely to be very disruptive for any child. Therefore, parents are forced to use full-time nurseries in order to fulfil hours of work. And in many cases, such as SNP Labour-led Edinburgh, uh, we commend the Council for allowing the 600 hours of free childcare to be purchased at these independent partnership private nurseries, whatever we call, uh, but in other cases, this is simply not allowed. So what we're saying is, if it can be done in Edinburgh by Labour and the SNP, why can't it be done elsewhere in Scotland? And when it comes to quality, all nurseries must achieve the standards set by the Care Inspectorate and Education Scotland in terms of environment, staff training and early learning. So there is no issue relating to the quality of the provider, public or private, given that they all have to meet the same requirements. I don't often say this, uh, and it's not often said from these benches, but I actually have to commend James Dornan, who's not... Oh, there he is. Yeah. James Dornan and Bob Doris, because I thought they had an absolute crystal clear grasp on what's happening in Glasgow. They understood the problems. They understood the nurseries. They understood the problems that parents faced. And I commend them on that. Uh, because Glasgow is an example where hundreds of families are unable to access their legal entitlement to free childcare because most nurseries do not offer suitable hours for working parents. And not all eligible children are able to access their entitlement in partnership nurseries due to the limited number of uh, funded places. Uh, as I said, the majority of funded places are in council nurseries uh, made up of a three-hour session morning or afternoon. And as Cara Hilton and others said, try getting a job that fits in with a three-hour uh, stint at the nursery. So in these circumstances, for parents in full-time work, a private nursery is a necessity. It is not a parental choice. And the Fair Funding for Our Kids campaign estimated that around half of the children in Glasgow and West Lothian uh, are currently unable to access this entitlement. That's something that we can't ignore, ignore and it shouldn't be ignored by the SNP after eight hours, eight, eight years, <laughs> eight years, it seems longer, uh, in government. Uh, the point is that if it's a legal entitlement that is not available to many children, we should now be asking the government to listen to parents and address the issue. The National Day Nurseries Association in Scotland also carried out research last year on this issue and discovered that the average funding per child per hour in Scotland was £3.80, with some local authorities paying as low as £2.80 per hour per child. So I would hope that the government would also work with local authorities to ensure that every nursery is resourced in order to provide the quality standards of care, but also to ensure that staff could be paid a reasonable wage for the responsible work that they do, work that we all value. And what is even more worrying is the quote from the NDNA, and I quote, the knock-on effect of low funding is a rise in the cost of parent paid for hours as nurseries are forced to make up the losses. 
So as the funded places rise from 475 to 600 and over 1,000 in the next session, the increased hours of low-rate funding will mean that more will be required from parents who pay to make up the losses. And with 87 of nurseries surveyed stating that the hourly rate from councils did not cover their costs, resulting in an average loss per hour of £1.72, this is a significant burden of payment from other parents. In other words, the increase in government funding for increased hours will result in some parents paying more due to the losses made by council funding. So when a government policy with a free legal entitlement of 600 hours of free childcare cannot practically be delivered in a way that is accessible to the many parents who work, then the government must step in. Our answer is funding should be more flexible, it should follow the child, it should be respectful to parental choice and not disruptive to the child. Thank you, Mrs Scanlon. That concludes the debate on nursery vouchers. The next item of business is consideration of business motion number 13346 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick. On behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme, I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 13346. Moved. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request speak button now. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put the question to the Chamber the question is that motion number 13346, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 13347, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a stage two timetable for the Scottish Elections Reduction of Voting Age Bill. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 13347. Moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 13347, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of two parliamentary bureau motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 13348 on approval of an SSI and motion number 13349 on suspension and variation of standing orders. Moved and moved. The question is on these motions will be put at decision time, to which we now come. There are eight questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 13313.2 in the name of Angela Constance, which seeks to amend motion number 13313 in the name of Liz Smith on Scotland's universities be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 13313.2 in the name of Angela Constance is as follows. Yes, 101. No, 14. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 13313.1 in the name of Ian Gray, which seeks to amend motion number 13313 in the name of Liz Smith on Scotland's universities be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 13313.1 
In the name of Ian Gray, is as follows. Yes, 38, no, 77. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is at motion number 13313. In the name of Liz Smith, as amended, on Scotland's universities be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 13313 in the name of Liz Smith as amended is as follows. Yes, 101. No, 14. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. Can I now remind members in relation to the debate on nursery vouchers, if the amendment in the name of Fiona MacLeod is agreed to, the amendment in the name of Cara Hilton falls. So the question is, the amendment number 13312.3 in the name of Fiona MacLeod, which seeks to amend motion number 13312 in the name of Liz Smith on nursery vouchers, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 13312.3 in the name of Fiona MacLeod is as follows. Yes, 64. No, 18. There were 33 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to and the amendment in the name of Cara Hilton falls. The next question is that motion number 13312 in the name of Liz Smith as amended on nursery vouchers be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament has not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cancel the votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 13312 in the name of Liz Smith as amended is as follows. Yes, 63. No, 19. There were 33 abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 13348 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 13349 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on the suspension and variation of standing orders be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.